But above all these things have charity, which is the bond of perfection. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I only learned about this much later on in life, but I want to start off talking to you a little bit about something that my grandmother had done when she was a young girl. Um, when she was little, she would have to walk every day to go to school. And uh, she had been taught from, you know, being raised Catholic, uh, you know, as a, as a child, she had been taught from very little on that we have to pray for the holy souls in purgatory and that, you know, you have to do sacrifices for them. And you can, you can help them out every time you pray and, and do sacrifices for the holy souls. And so she, in you know, her, her generosity of, as children truly have, she, every day when she would walk to school by herself, she would uh, figure that that was a perfect time to offer prayers and sacrifices for the holy souls. And she would say little prayers to them, little Hail Marys. And she would uh, make little sacrifices along the way. She would sometimes put a pebble into her shoe, she told me, or sometimes she would remove her glove when it would be cold outside for a little while until her hand started to sting, and then she would put it back on as to you know, make sure she didn't get frostbite or anything like that. But she would take it off to, to sacrifice a little, and she would always have in her mind little ejaculations to say for the benefit of the holy souls. And that's why she would spend every day walking to school and walking home from school, trying to help out the poor souls in purgatory. And it's that idea which made me think, perhaps it's a good idea to provide an explanation of purgatory. So many of us hear regularly that we should be devoted to the holy souls of purgatory, but I think the reason why purgatory exists and the reason why we need to help the holy souls and how to do so are very important questions that has to be addressed. So the more we understand it, the more apt we are to actually follow through with assisting those holy souls in purgatory. So why purgatory? Purgatory is itself a great mercy from God. Now, when we look at it from the outset, from just kind of from afar, we think to ourselves, right, souls suffering in, for a duration of time is a mercy. That seems kind of strange. But when we peel back the, the initial vision, the initial onion layer, as it were, of what purgatory is, then we realize it truly is just that. It is a great mercy from God. It is a great benefit to all of our souls. Because any soul that enters into heaven, that stands before the throne of God, that is there for all eternity to praise and, and give glory to Him, it has to be perfect. That is the infinite God. And so therefore the only souls that are, that are, are, are worthy, if it could be said, to stand before Him, are those that are without blemish whatsoever. And yet the souls that, that we have so many souls do not die completely pure. Rather, they are kind of in this in-between state. They might not die with mortal sin on their soul. They die, you know, in a state of sanctified grace. And so they have saved their souls, yet they haven't been really uh, perfect in their life. And so they have perhaps some venial sins upon their soul, and uh, perhaps they haven't really done anything in life to, or enough enough in life to, to, to the way of sacrifice to take away any of the stain of sin. And the understanding that a soul can die, a person can die while in a state of grace, but not completely purified, needs for us to understand exactly what sin is and what, what occurs with sin to the soul. When we sin, we incur upon ourselves not one, but two debts that are owed in justice back to God. The first debt that is incurred by our act of sin is that of the debt of guilt. That's the one we most often think of. That is the fact that we've sinned, we've sinned, we've offended God, and so therefore we need to apologize to God by means of, of confession and have that sin forgiven 
to, uh, of us. And uh, so we do that by making a good confession itself. That debt of, of guilt is something that we can never pay off. That debt of guilt, what is the punishment that was given to Adam and Eve in the garden for their, their guilt of the sin? It was that of death. We could never do anything in our lives to make up that debt adequately because there are two ways to pay off a debt one is that we actually pay the debt back so if somebody were to borrow a hundred dollars from me and then they were to give me a hundred dollars back they have paid the debt off but there's a second way that debt can be forgiven and that is that the one who is owed relieves the person of the burden of the debt itself and that is the way the debt of guilt is taken away from us. Christ, he is the only one that was able to sacrifice sufficiently to remove that debt of guilt. And so he came, he became man, he died for our sins, and, uh, and therefore we have the ability to save our souls now to pay off that debt that is due of guilt for sin. And it's through that death on the cross that the grace has come to us by confession to forgive us our sins. All of the sacraments stem from the from the, from Christ Himself, and so therefore that's where it comes to us in the confessional. But there's a second debt that is due towards sin, and that is a debt of penance, of sacrifice. And unlike the first, this debt is a debt that we have to pay. It's something that well, we are the ones responsible for, for, for giving back to our Lord. And so we, in turn, have to make up by sacrifice and by penance for the wrongs that we've done. And uh, it, if we don't sufficiently take care of that debt, then we have what is known as the stain of sin upon our souls. Sometimes the best way to understand this is by way of a bit of analogy that we have with ourselves that analogy of a white cloth. Think about the last time you saw a confession, I mean a, a baptism take place. The priest baptizes the, the baby with, with the water on his head and then in turn, after he anoints him with chrism on, the, on his forehead, what does he do? He imposes upon the child a white garment. And he tells the child to guard that garment and keep it unblemished because that is a representation of his soul now from baptism. It is pure, it is, it is pristine, it is absolutely perfect in its whiteness. That garment was worn by, uh, by the catechumens in the early days of the church for an entire week after their baptism. That's why the week, the, the Sunday after Easter, which was the time of the traditionally of, of baptism, is called Dominica and Albis because it is the Sunday in which they return their white garments to the church. But that white garment is a very good representation of our souls. And sin is very much like taking flame to a white garment. We burn it, we burn a hole through it. That's what the sin is. The hole itself is that debt of guilt. And so by making a good confession, we sew up the hole. We've made our cloth complete again. And so therefore, we can wear it again. It would not be proper for us to show up with holes in our, in our cloth. But So we sew up the hole in the cloth by our confession. But there's still something more that remains to that cloth that keeps it from perfection. Yes, it's, it's complete. Yes, it's patched up and there's no more holes in it. But there's still, when we burn cloth, leaves mark with it. There's this brown ring around the, where the hole once was. There's this blemish there that now can only be taken out by very rigorous effort, by hard scrubbing of the cloth, and then that stain is finally removed. It's perfectly white again, and, and it looks like it did in its original state. So that, that, that scrubbing of the stain, that's the penance due towards sin. Now, the reason why purgatory is such a great mercy is that if we don't do enough scrubbing of our souls, if we don't do enough penance in this life, which many of us do not because of the fact that we're weak, we just 
don't, we're not inclined to sacrifice. We're not inclined to do penance. And so we, we shy away from it. We have to keep forcing ourselves to do so. And if we don't do a sufficient amount to make up for the stain that is due to our sin, God still gives us the opportunity to do so by means of purgatory. All right, you run out of time in this life, but I'll give you an extended time period to do a little bit more sacrificing until you're ready to, to come in to the gates of heaven. And that is purgatory. The souls there are completely happy. The souls there are completely resigned. They know exactly what happened to them is, is just, and they wouldn't want to stand before the throne of God as uh, dirty looking as they are. They want to clean themselves up before they come into heaven. They have all of eternity waiting for them, so that little bit of time that they spend in purgatory is only right and just, so that they can stand before God forever as perfectly as possible. And so those souls, they're sent, they have a sentence, they have a time period of suffering that's there that they need to work off. And once they enter in there, that's it. They just have to wait for that given time to be up. They can't shorten it. They can't alleviate themselves. They can't do anything to make it go by either less painfully or more quickly. But we can. We can aid them. We can assist them by our actions here in our own life. So what are some of those means in which we do that? Well, first and foremost, offering masses for the holy souls in purgatory. A great act of charity to have the highest prayer offered for the holy souls. And so, as such, we can have masses said for the holy souls. They're eternally great, grateful for us. And we each mass is, is like a great wash of cool water upon them, alleviating them and, and releasing many souls from those chains. We can also offer up our own communion for them. That we, when we come to the rail, we have an intention for the graces received by our good communions. And one of those graces, one of those intentions could certainly be the holy souls of purgatory. Saint, uh, Saint Gertrude the Great, when, when used to occasionally offer up her communions for, for the holy souls. And she was not able to receive communion as frequently as, as you all were, are able to. It was a less, much less frequent. And she would offer it up at times. For the holy souls and she always was filled with this great joy at doing so and she would ask she asked our lord one time because our lord appeared to sink her pretty regularly and she asked him one time why was it that she was filled with such joy at, at the offering of her communion and our lord told her that you know it, he could not help but to share the fruits of such a great act of charity with the one who made the action and that's why she was filled with joy. We also, also offer up our sacrifices in our life. The little things that inconvenience us, the little things that the, the trials that we have, the crosses that we, that we bear, the discomforts that we may, we may endure, the sicknesses that we may have, what, whatever they may be, all of those things are opportunities to sacrifice for the souls in purgatory. But there's another means outside of our own prayers and our, and our sacrifices and things like that that is an extension of the mercy of God himself through the church to help us help the souls of purgatory. And that is indulgences. And on that you know, I want to talk a little bit more. Indulgences are something that we see pretty regularly. We open up our prayer book and many of our prayers have indulgences attached to them. And many things that we, many actions that we hear, all oh, this, and you know, if you do this, you gain an indulgence, or if you do this, you gain a, a, an indulgence. Then we, and we kind of almost gloss over it. We don't really, we see it and we know that it, ha it takes place, but we don't really conceive what exactly is required and what exactly those actions mean. So an indulgence is the, the church allowing us to perform some simpler action in order to gain a great grace for temporal punishment due to sin. And there are two types of indulgences. The first of which is the plenary indulgence. This is the, the highest of indulgences of the church. One plenary indulgence is sufficient to remit all of the, the punishment due to sin for a soul. Whether it be we gain it for ourselves or we gain it for the holy souls in purgatory, wherever the object is, you know, it is sufficient for all of the stain of sin, all of the punishment due to sin for 
something for an individual. And the, but because it's such a great grace from the church, great mercy, the church has certain requirements that are necessary in order to gain a plenary indulgence. And it's important that we remember all of them so we are able to gain them with regularity. First off, the church asks that anybody seeking to gain a plenary indulgence, they have to have gone and made a good holy communion and made a good confession of their sins within eight days on either end of the action. So whether it's the day of the action that you perform or within eight days time, either before or afterwards, one has to have had gone to confession and made a reception of a good, worthy, holy communion in order to gain the plenary indulgence. There is also a requirement in order to gain a plenary indulgence that one must say an Our Father, a Hail Mary, and a Glory Be to the intentions of the Church to gain the indulgence. So in addition to whatever action it is, we have to add those of that Our Father, Hail Mary, and Glory Be for that very intention of gaining the plenary indulgence. Thirdly, as a requirement, to gain a plenary indulgence, it's not sufficient that we think the prayer. It has to be, as, the, as it's called, a vocal prayer. Now, when we come to church here, or, or, or when a, around other people, that does not mean we have to actually voice it. We don't want to, to speak our prayers when other people are, are saying prayers because it's distracting to them. We want to, but we have to at least mouth our prayers. And so we, we have to form the words with our mouths. When we are on our own or we're praying in union with another person, yeah, we say that our prayers aloud. But when we're by our when we're around other people and we're you know, like like when you're here at church and you're saying your own devotions, do not vocalize them, just mouth them and the and the same graces are gained. But we have to at least mouth the words of a prayer for plenary indulgence. Next and one that is oftentimes overlooked is that a person gaining a plenary indulgence must be free from all sin. Now, it makes sense that one has to be free from mortal sin to gain a plenary indulgence. Because how can you gain one of the greatest mercies of God while still being an enemy of God? Because that's what mortal sin makes us. It makes us an enemy in the eyes of God. And it's only through our choice. He wants us to be close to him, but we've chosen to push him away by mortal sin. So we have to obviously rectify the situation of mortal sin to gain the plenary indulgence. But we have to also be free from all venial sin too. And that seems from the outset that it would be extremely hard, especially when the mindset of the, the mindful of the scriptures that the just man falls seven times in a day. But... It's not that difficult when we think of just how we can remit venial sin. Yes, there's the means of confession for venial sin, and confession is necessary to remit mortal sin. But venial sin can be forgiven by confession or a myriad of other ways. Every time we use a sacramental well and properly, we use holy water well, for instance, we can remit more, uh, venial sin. Every time we receive holy communion, we can remit venial sin. Every time we perform a true act of charity, we can remit venial sin by that. And every time we make an act of contrition, we can have our venial sins taken away. So when we are going to gain the plenary indulgence, be sure to, to try to perform one of those things beforehand. At the very least, say the act of contrition, so that way the venial sins can be taken away, and, and thus the, the indulgence gained well and properly. And lastly, as a, as a restriction, we are limited, limited to one plenary indulgence per day. Uh, and uh, that's, the, you know, we, we don't want to abuse such great uh, mercy. So the church gives us a limit of one per day. Yet it gives us another means of working for the souls too. And that's the partial indulgence. And too often times we, we see these and we kind of like glance over what the number is, we'll say all 300 days indulgence, a three year indulgence, and we don't really pay attention to what it says, we just are more concerned about saying the prayer or finding the prayer that we like or whatever it may be. But those, the reason why 
that indulgence is included with the time frame of it is because the time is important. And when we and understanding that time is a great motivator for us to gain plenary indulgences for ourselves. Because that number, if it says three hundred days indulgence, or it says one year indulgence, or three year indulgence, whatever the time frame may be, that number means something for us. And it's really, when we think about it, something truly incredible. What is the time frame attached to indulgence equal to? Well, it's equal to the number of the days of performing hard canonical penance from the early church. When the certain sins would have strict penances attached to them and they would have to go walk barefoot through the streets and they would be saying the psalms and scourging themselves and, and, uh, and genuflecting 50 times while they, you know, and, you know, doing all of these different acts of, of severe penance for themselves to remit sins. Those indulgence prayers that, you know, might be one or two sentences long and we get you know, 300 days indulgence, that's worth 300 days of performing hard, laborious penance by action. And so when we realize that that simple ejaculation that took us two seconds to say is equal to three years worth of hard penance, it motivates us so much more to perform these things regularly. There's another type of partial indulgence as well that people really oftentimes don't understand what it means. And that's what is known as a quarantine. You don't see those as often, but you do see certain actions will say, you know, three quarantines, seven quarantines. What's a quarantine? A quarantine is the equivalent, one quarantine is the equivalent of 40 days hard canonical fasting. Now, I don't mean the American means of fasting that, oh, I can't make, I have to make sure my two small meals don't add up more than my main meal and I'm only going to eat meat once in a day. That's kind of barely a sacrifice, really. What I mean is the early church hard monastic type of fast where they would sometimes go completely without food or perhaps just subsist on some basic bread and water or soup and water, you know, but mostly broth and, and a water. That, that type of fasting where we're barely taking any kind of sustenance whatsoever, a hard canonical fast. One quarantine equals 40 consecutive days of doing that. So when we do uh, an action that has seven quarantines attached to it, that's the equivalent of fasting for 280 days. And all we did was simply say a prayer. So, with November being upon us now, we're reminded to pray for the holy souls of purgatory. And we're reminded that it is a great amount of good that we can really do on their behalf. They're part of the same mystical body of Christ as ourselves. We are the church militant. They are the church suffering. The souls in heaven are the church triumphant. We all work together as one. We're all part of that same Christ. And when one member is in need, like the church suffering is in need of our prayers, of our intercession, what better means of an act of charity can we do than to assist that those members of the, of the mystical body of Christ? And with all of that knowledge of what indulgences are, just the power of them, now we can go forward and be more conscious of those little spaces of time throughout our day. Those little pockets where I'm walking from my house to my car. I can do nothing, or I can say a small little ejaculation that has an indulgence attached to it. Or those times when I have to go out and, and shovel the drive when it snows, and I'm cold and I, and I just don't want to be doing it. I can do nothing and have to shovel my driveway, or I can offer it up as a sacrifice for the souls of purgatory. And each time I do so, it is just that. It is an act of charity done for a, a member of the mystical body of Christ in need. And in return, those mystical body, those members of the mystical body that we have helped, they are grateful. They help us in their gratitude. They intercede for us, for our own benefit and our spiritual strengthening. And I have no doubt that that is exactly what assisted my own dear grandmother. Those simple actions of a child 
taking advantage of those little spaces in time, that when later in life, and she had fallen away from the practice of the faith for decades, when later in life she was faced with that, that idea of eternity, she turned back to that church, converted back, made good confession, made good receptions of the sacraments for months afterwards, and died a very good and holy death. If you don't think that that comes from the intercession of her friends that she made while she was small, then we're missing the greater picture of it all. Build up your army of friends, those good holy souls, by helping them out, and you too will be, will be granted many graces by their intercession for you in front of the, whole, the throne of God for all eternity. May God bless you.